Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. This training is for the sites that are currently designated CSI. For a copy of this PowerPoint, you are welcome to email me at zeta, Z-A-D-A dot Siri, S-E-R-Y at S-D-E dot O-K dot gov. And if you're working in the GMS system and you encounter any errors or glitches, feel free to send me an email. Uh, screenshots are encouraged. This webinar will be posted on our website. Um, and so we'll get that uh, put up just a little later this week. We'll also ail uh, mail, email out those links to you. Um, each CSI site has an assigned school support specialist, so you'll probably receive that link from your school support specialist. If you have any questions as we go through the PowerPoint, please feel free to type those in the chat box at any time and we'll answer them at the end, or you can wait until the end and ask your question. In today's presentation, we're going to go through the timeline. And then we're going to talk about the FY20 Project 515 budget. We're going to go through the abbreviated version of the Joint Federal Programs Claims Procedures for FY20. And then again, we'll address any questions that come up. This is our continuous improvement cycle flower that many of you are very, very familiar with from the regional meetings that took place uh, earlier in the spring. This particular part of your process is planning for implementation. So we've just let you know where you are in the process when it comes to budgeting your funds. Timeline this year, July 1st, the FY20 Project 515 budget will open and it will have your implementation funds loaded in it. September 1st, 2019, carryover funds will be loaded in GMS, those carryover funds are the planning funds that you received a little earlier this year in FY19. I load those carryover funds on your behalf, so you do not need to do a closeout report for Project 515. September 30, 2019 is the last day to encumber those, those carryovers or the, excuse me, the carryover or the planning funds. And 12-31, December 31, 2019, your carryover or your planning funds expire. Unfortunately, there are no extensions or exceptions to that. Um, so make sure that you get those claims in by the 31st of December and that they are in payable form. June 30th, 2020 is the end of the fiscal year. It's also the last day to encumber funds for FY20. And August 1st is the claims deadline. Any claims received after August 1st, 2020 for FY20 will be considered late. For technical assistance, we have a variety of options to help you. Um, first, this month we have our regional meetings. We have um, some starting next week and then moving into the week after that. Most of you will be at those meetings. I will be at those meetings. So if you have questions, please feel free to come find me and I can answer those questions for you. We will also be available um, for technical assistance at the Engage OK conference. We will have a resource room that you can come and visit and ask any questions. Personally, I will be at the Lawton conference, the Bixby conference, and the Moore conference. So again, if you have any questions or you need assistance or any training, um, again, just come find us and talk to us and we'll get that all set up for you. If you haven't heard already, we're going to have a joint federal program summit on November 4th here in the metro area. There is more information about that. We'll be headed out a little later this summer, probably after they get finished with the Engage OK conferences. And if you're not able to make it to any of those in-person meetings, we will have PowerPoints and webinars posted on our web page throughout the first year of the grant cycle. You can also email us or call us. Um, including me, you're more than welcome to email me or call me directly. And then if you need on-site training or would like to ask questions during an on-site visit or you would like to request that I come out um, and, and do some training with your folks on the GMS system or with the budget or anything like that, feel free to uh, contact me and we will get that set up for you. 
Typically at this time, I would go into the live GMS site, but unfortunately as of this morning, the FY20 Project 515 budget is not ready yet, so we're just gonna talk through it. All expenditures are for the implementation of your continuous improvement plan, also known as the SIP. Um, we will have a presentation um, specifically on the SIP and how to fill out that plan. Uh, at those regional meetings that I mentioned earlier. The formula amount is expected to be approximately $50,000 per site. Uh, again, we will get you an exact number a little closer to when that budget opens. The LEA financial contact and the leadership team um, should work together to complete the budget. And um, if, again, if you have any questions about allowability or how to complete the budget or uh, coding or anything like that, feel free to contact me directly. The expenditure descriptions are expected to be detailed. Uh, supplies, salaries, instructional materials, those are not sufficient descriptions in the budget. Therefore, if you have unknown expenditures or you have maybe a professional development that you know you want to go to but you're not sure which vendor you're going to use, you can always indicate with a to be determined or just the words placeholder. You can then come back in later and make an amendment when you know those specific details. Amendments can be made to your budget until June 30, 2020. Personnel, please be aware that Project 515 does not have an embedded personnel page in GMS. Instead, that we ask that you accurately enter all of your personnel into school personnel records. Um, that means an allowable job code for our program uh, that is coded to Project 515 and that it has a reasonable and necessary salary. The position title will be entered in the description box of the budget detail but the name is not required. The name will be required on the claim, but is not required in the budget. Just be advised that tutors do not have to be entered in school personnel records until the end of the school year. However, if you choose not to enter tutors in school personnel records uh, and submit a claim, you will need to provide a timesheet for them uh, to get that reimbursed. And we can talk about that a little bit more later. Under ESSA, we are being authorized to allow some new things that we've not done before with School Improvement uh, 1003A funds, and one of those is indirect cost. So starting in FY20, indirect cost will be available to you on these funds. Right now, the plan is to budget those funds on a 000 district level budget in GMS, and we can go, th uh, go through that specifically when that budget actually opens and you have questions. But it should be pretty straightforward and very similar to how you budget indirect costs for your Title I-A funds. The other thing that we will be allowing this year is administrative costs, function code 2330. Again, these are activities associated with maintaining and administering those federal grant dollars. There is a 2% maximum on those administrative costs, so we will be verifying that everyone stays under the 2% maximum. Previously, we offered a 5% amount for consumables that is no longer available with these funds. So the indirect cost and the administrative cost have taken the place of that 5% for consumables, so that's what we'll be using instead. On your GMS budget detail page, you're going to see two new areas. Again, you will have your function object code, just like we always have. You'll have your expenditure description and your amounts, just like we always have. But you're going to see two new columns. The first column is an evidence-based intervention, and it will be a drop-down menu. You will select for each expenditure either strong, moderate, or promising EBI or not applicable if it is an expenditure that's associated with a non-EBI project. Again, you're only looking at the EBIs that you've identified in your continuous improvement plan. 
This will be used for federal reporting that we will do on an annual basis. The next column that you will see that's new on the GMS Project 515 budget is the nine essential elements, pillar, and element drop-down menu. And again, it will list out all of those pillars and elements and it aligns with what is currently in the continuous improvement plan. There is also a not applicable feature, but again, the only things that we feel like would be not applicable would be your administrative costs or possibly your planning costs. The rest of your expenditures will need to align with a pillar and element that has been identified in the continuous improvement plan. And we will use this for state reporting. At this time, we're going to move into an abbreviated version of the Joint Federal Programs Claims Procedure. These claims will come out in uh, FY20, so it'll be a little bit closer to the end of June, beginning of July. Again, this is our continuous improvement process, and so filing claims would be a part of the implementation step. Our office does comply with the OSDE Joint Federal Programs Claims Procedures. These procedures are updated annually. We do have them reviewed by a variety of stakeholders, including district partners, and they are printed and available in the back of the OCAS manual every year. The purpose of these claims procedures are to reduce the likelihood of errors, as well as increase the efficiency in which claims are paid. Uh, LEAs choosing not to follow these claims procedures run the risk of their claims being significantly delayed or outright denied. Your expenditures must be reasonable and necessary and allocable. Please remember that all expenditures are subject to program specific requirements. In this presentation, we are talking about expenditure um, policies and procedures that are specific to Project 515 funds. And again, we use the grants management system, which is available to you through single sign-on. Zero dollar claims are not required for any federal programs. However, claims should account for all 12 months starting with July. So an example of this would be if you did not have any expenditures in July or August, but you did in September, then you would still start your claim on July 1st, and then you would run that claim through the end of September. This is not necessarily new, but it has recently been added to the claims procedures, so it'll be in there uh, when they print the next version. Copies of purchase orders are not required. The reason they're not required is because the detailed expenditure report that you upload to the claim has your purchase order number and the date on it, so we don't actually need a copy of the PO. The only time that we would need a copy of the PO is if you're using it as a contract. Images of checks are strongly discouraged. This is a safety and security issue. Um, unless the program specifically asks you to upload your check, please do not do that. Claims begin on the first day of the month, and they end on the last day of a month. It doesn't matter if the last day of a month falls on a holiday or a weekend. It needs to be the last day of the month. So first day and last day, and as many months in between. The date range entered on GMS must match the date range that's on your uploaded summary expenditure report and your detailed expenditure report. This is probably the number one reason that claims get sent back. So make sure that your dates align before you submit that claim. Claims also need to be signed by the local Board of Education authorized official. The claims in GMS that you hand enter need to align with your local cost accounting system, summary expenditure report, and detailed expenditure report. That's pretty straightforward. For the Office of School Support, we allocate to the site level, so your expenditure reports do need to indicate the site code. And just for uh, efficiency, you should review your claims at the LEA level for accuracy before you submit them to SCE. 
This one we're going to talk about a little bit. It hasn't been too much of a problem this last year, but it has come up with a couple of districts. Payments made with a district credit card, which is also known as a payment agent, must have the vendor name listed on the detailed expenditure report. An example of this would be if you used a Visa credit card to reserve your room at the Holiday Inn, then when you went to claim that, you would need to list out Visa slash Holiday Inn. At the bottom of the slide is the School Laws of Oklahoma citation where this is talked about. And if you have any questions about this at all, feel free to talk to us about it. Um, I will say that when I have returned claims for this, what I have been told is that the local cost accounting system can't do this. The response I have is that the Office of Finance and Accounting here at SDE works with all approved local cost accounting vendors. And so yes, those systems can do this and you need to contact your vendor and work through how to get this uh, accurately written on your detailed expenditure report. Please note that Project 515 claims should be submitted monthly or quarterly. LEAs with no claims filed by November will be contacted, and we will be providing monthly reminders to LEAs um, that will typically be your school support specialist contacting you. Uh, just make sure that you're on track financially as well as with your projects and uh, initiatives for the year. Late claims. Uh, the deadline is August 1st. Claims that are submitted after August 1st are considered late and they are subject to different rules. So make sure that you get claims, whether it's for FY19 or FY20, make sure that you get those in to us before the deadline of August 1st. As everybody knows and is well aware, the Dun sams entity record must be current before you can be paid for a claim. If it's expired, you need to attach a copy to your claim. SDE does recommend that LEAs renew their SAMS, their Dun sams number uh, as close to July 1st as possible so that it doesn't expire within the grant year. Function object code must align with the expenditure description and LEA should consult with the most current version of the OCAS manual for coding. You can find a current version of this on the website. You are also encouraged to contact your program office with specific questions. In this case, you are more than welcome to contact me directly or contact your school support specialist and they can get an answer for you. We would much, much, much rather have you contact us ahead of time and ask those coding questions than to have to return a budget because the coding was not right. Supporting documentation, it should be in PDF format. It should be clear and legible. We prefer that it's loaded in the same order as the expenditures on your claim. No uploads with special character names that are seen on the screen. The reason for that is that GMS does not acknowledge them. So when I go to click on that uh, with a special character in the name, I get a, a file not found error and I have to return it to you. We ask that you not use a highlighter on your documentation because it shows up dark and gray and we can't see what it says. If you are sharing or splitting costs on your invoice with another program, let's say Title I or Special Ed, just handwrite on the receipt so that the reviewer of the claim is aware of how that's being paid. If a claim is returned to you, please use revised or corrected if you have to upload something else to the claim. This is just a little graphic to help, you remi uh, help remind you that you need to have your purchase order in place first before any invoices or services are rendered and then you would pay after the invoice or services are rendered. Um, this has been a big problem in FY19 for our schools. I've had to send a lot of claims back because the services were provided on a certain date and then the funds were encumbered after that date. And that is not the correct order. If you have a professional development happening on site, then the funds need to be encumbered before that professional development takes place. So again, we want the funds encumbered or purchase order in place first then the invoices or services, and then after that, then you can pay it and would have a warrant date. And again, we've given you the citation on the bottom of where you would find that in uh, the Oklahoma Administrative Code. Here we go into the different object codes. We're just going to do a brief overview of each. 
Again, if you have any specific questions, feel free to ask those. Object code 100 is personnel services. Personnel should be entered in accurately into school personnel records before you submit a claim. And tutors are going to use object code 139 according to the OCAS manual. If you decide not to put your tutors in school personnel records, again, they're not required to be entered until the end of the school year, then please be aware that documentation is required on the claim. If you submit a claim for professional development stipends, then we need a copy of the registration and or the sign-in sheet. Entering personnel in a school personnel record accurately means it's an allowable job code. It's coded to Project 515. It has a reasonable and necessary salary and that the details align with what you have put in your FY20 Project 515 budget as well as it aligns with what you submitted in your school improvement plan. Stipends for professional development that require a paid registration, they need to be required, they need to have that registration invoice, which would include the name of the professional development and the participant names. If you did not have to do a paid registration, then we would need an agenda that has the name and the participant names on it. Object code 200 is for benefits. We do not require any documentation for benefits. Object code 300 is for contracts. Amounts for professional and technical services rendered by personnel not on the payroll of the LEA is what a contract is. If the person is on the payroll of LEA, you cannot code them 300. Again, you would include invoices for these services as part of your documentation. Your purchase order should be in place before any contracted services take place. So if you are contracting with an external provider, then you need to have that purchase order in place before that external provider provides any contracted services to your site. Contracting with tutors does not exempt the tutors from being certified in the area that they are tutoring in. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to contact me and we can talk about uh, tutor certification. Object code 400 is purchase property services. It is highly unlikely that you will use this in project 515. Object code 500, other purchase services. Uh, we use a lot of codes in this category for travel. SDE honors the travel policy of the LEAs, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Again, your documentation would be receipts for real cost or your per diem forms. If it was a non-SDE uh, professional development, then we would require an agenda or a program uh, or a certificate of attendance. Please do not attach conference badges, airline tickets, hotel keys, photographs, instructional materials, or multi-page brochures. We do not need any of those things. They are not required, and they make it more difficult for us to find the, the documentation that we do actually need. So I said that SDE honors the travel policy of the district. This has come up several times this past year. What that means is that if the LEA travel policy allows for per diem, then the LEA must request per diem on the claim and then include any appropriate paperwork, which would be the per diem form that your district has the staff fill out when they request uh, their reimbursement for travel. So if your district policy requires on relies on per diem, then you would not attach receipts for real cost items. You would use your district's per diem policy. If your district's policy allows for real cost, then you must request real cost on your claim. So you would include receipts for food, receipts for taxis, et cetera, et cetera. So it's one or the other and you're following whatever your district travel policy is. That's how you're requesting reimbursement. If necessary, airfare, hotel reservations, workshop reservations, those can all be paid in advance. However, real-time expenses like your per diem or your food, the luggage fees, any uh, Lyft or Uber rides, all of those real-time costs, those cannot be paid in advance. You need to wait until the trip is over. 
As always, alcohol, gum, candy, snacks, souvenirs, jewelry, and personal expenses are not allowed and will not be reimbursed. And this one is not necessarily new, but it is recently added to the claims procedures, and that is that transportation to restaurants, shopping, and entertainment areas will not be reimbursed. Object code 600 is for supplies. Uh, invoices and receipts are the documentation required for supply purchases. Please note that quotes are not accepted as documentation. This one is not necessarily new, but we have clarified it in the FY20 claims procedures. Licenses and subscriptions must take place in the fiscal year that is being funded. We've provided you a citation for where to find the general fund definition in the school laws of Oklahoma. SDE recommends that LEAs work with their vendors to ensure that all annual licenses and subscriptions that are intended for reimbursement with federal funds run between July 1st and June 30th. Itemized warranties that exceed one year are not allowable. If you have a warranty for three years, you will need to um, you will need to just pay for the one year. This one is new, so I just want to point this one out. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or ask in the chat box. But starting on July 1 for FY20 Project 515 funds, we will no longer pay for food or food-related expenditures. That does include light snacks and refreshments for parent and family engagement. We will no longer be paying for that in FY20. This also includes catering of any kind for any reason. So that is new for us, and we just want you to be aware of that so that you do not budget for any food because we'll have to return that budget to you. Gift cards, gift certificates, and incentives are also not allowable with Project 515 funds. Object code 700 is the code for property. Indirect cost is not calculated against property, and you would just attach, attach any invoices for documentation purposes. An example of when to use object code 700 would be if there's an itemized receipt of four computers, each computer costs $500 and it was 25 computers, then you would have a total of 12,500. In this case, you would use object code 600 because each computer is broken out or itemized on the receipt. If the invoice, however, lists a single line item, such as a computer lab, turnkey computer lab for $12,500, then you would use object code 700. Object code 800 is for other objects, typically in this category. Um, we do professional development registration and tuition reimbursement. Registration invoices that include the name and the participant's name would serve as a documentation. And if you're doing tuition reimbursement, then we require a copy of the transcript, the, st uh, the staff person's name, the course title, and that they passed the course. Okay. I did that in almost the exact same time as the last session, so I'm pretty proud of that. Um, but we are at the end. So if you have any questions at all about this presentation, please feel free to type those in the chat box for me and we will get those answered. If you think of questions later or have a question that you would rather ask via email, please feel free to email me at zeta.siri at sde.ok.gov um, or you can call me um, and I will try and get back to you as soon as possible. We'll give it about another minute See if anybody has any questions at all. And again, we'll have this PowerPoint available to you on our website a little later on this week. Okay, if there's no other questions, then we will go ahead and finish for the day. Thank you.